Hi, everyone. My name is Colin Curitan, and I work as a supply chain development specialist with the University of Minnesota's Forever Green Initiative. In this segment, we'll speak briefly with two industry partners on their interest, activities, challenges, and opportunities they see with new winter annual oil seeds, including winter camelina and pennycress. We're seeing a lot of interest from industry partners in camelina and pennycress, ranging from startup companies to well-established international CPGs and ag sector companies. As oil seeds, end uses for these new crops span food, feed, energy, and industrial product applications. For winter camelina, early market channels of interest include feed, particularly equine and aquaculture, PHA biopolymers, oil for cooking, and other food-based products. Canada has a bit of a head start in camelina with multiple companies emerging with a focus on feed and oil. For Pennycrest, early commercial activity has focused on sustainable aviation fuel, sometimes called renewable jet fuel, and moving the meal for feed. Breeding efforts at UMN and elsewhere is very rapidly moving toward varieties better suited for food uses. Any food use of either winter annual oil seed will be contingent on the grass process or generally recognized as safe. Today, we'll be hearing from two industry partners. Jack Rodchog is the Sustainable Ag Field Manager with Nutrient Ag Solutions. Nutrient Ag Solutions offers a wide range of products and services to service clients in the agricultural sector. Chris Handel is the Vice President of St Strategy and Operations for Covercress. Covercress is based in St. Louis and is focusing on commercializing pennycress in the southern half of the Midwest and is focusing on renewable diesel and renewable jet fuel and feed markets. So thanks for joining us today. And Jack, we'll start with you. Uh, can you describe uh, to our group today what motivates your company to get involved with these new winter annual oil seeds like Camelina? And can you describe your efforts so far? Well, thanks, Colin. Um, really, what we are looking for most of all is to make sure that we're doing right by our farmers, right? As a retail business, we got to watch out for our farmers and make sure we have options available for them as they need them. And I think really there's more and more questions being asked on, on how can farmers diversify and maybe capture a market, especially with the number of corn acres we've had this year. You've seen some of the prices, the commodity prices um, going down in both corn and soybeans and some of those typical uh, crops you can see. Um, and so winter gamelina kind of allows um, an option to diversify and really add um, add some some diversification to the crop mix, right? And and the way we're looking to utilize it is as a, a relay crop Um hopefully be able to harvest it in the spring, um, you know, uh, with soybeans being planted into it. Um, and so um, I, I think the opportunity is really there and, and really a cool opportunity to try it out. Um, and then beyond that, you know, long term, we're working with a company that's developing uh, genetically modified PHA trait in the Camelina. So I think long term, um, we look at that as being a really good option besides the current option of uh, you know, obviously getting the the uh, oil and the meal and, and the, you know, added nutritional value of the oil. Um, I think we look long term at that PHA. So, so number one, it's really again, getting more options for our farmers um, and, and helping them to diversify if they so choose. Um, but then number two is I think long term, there, there may be some more options there to capture more of a specialty type market with some of the genetically modified traits that are possibly out there. So. Great. Thanks, Jack. What are you seeing as some of the early challenges to launching commercializing this new crop in the U.S.? So early challenges really revolve around just what you said there, just getting a crop commercialized. So the, the big problem is de-risking for farmers. Um, while we want to provide an option and we feel like it's, it's, it, there's an economic advantage uh, to diversify a crop mix for a farmer, um, today in Minnesota there is no insurance for planting camelina. Um, you know, there's currently no herbicides labeled for camelina. So, um, you know, those are the biggest hurdles that, uh, that we're trying to fight. And, and again, uh, the Forever Green Group has really helped us along uh, in getting some of the things that are needed and, and potential programs out there. But that's the biggest challenge um, is just commercializing a new crop and, and all the issues that come along with that um, within, uh, you know, the de-risking uh, portion for the farmer. Thanks, Jack. Really appreciate it. Going to move over to Chris now. Um, Chris, can you share what motivates your company, Covercrest, to get involved with these new winter annual oil seeds like Pennycrest? And can you describe your efforts so far and your plans for the near term? Sure. So uh, just like J uh, Jack said, we also focus on farmer options. Uh, it was a combination pretty much of environmental options and farmer options. So the southern half of the Midwest, as uh, most of you all know, it's uh, pretty much a rotation of corn and soy. 
and bringing a third crop into this rotation, still not, uh, not taking land away from the main two summer crops, it was a really interesting idea for us, bringing like more soil health, using all the, the nutrients left over from, from corn, uh, using water in a different way that the, the, the two summer crops would use, and adding a profit new revenue for, for farmers is the biggest way that we, is the biggest goal that we saw in this opportunity. What we've done so far uh, was a lot around uh, product development, so uh, genetic or plant genetics work from the start. We started a breeding program uh, from a germplasm collection. So collected germplasm for basically two years broadly, then after that it was like a, a more opportunistic and then uh, a lot of breeding, a lot of gene editing, a lot of molecular genetics work uh, to get this new crop to a place where we really like it right now. And what are you seeing as the main challenges to launching uh, commercial pennycrest production in the near future? So now what we're doing is we're focused on the next set of challenges. Not that we are stopping with any of the, the R&D, of course, but um, the next set of challenges for us is uh, make farmers understand what product we have. So increasing farmer adoption in a way that they understand what they're planting, how it's supposed to behave. What happens in a spring like like this one, like you know, a very cold and wet spring? Uh, what what they can expect? So get get a very transparent view to farmers. See which of the farmers are the ones that are the the first ones, the innovators. One we have a we have a cl farmer club called the Founding Farmers for for Pennycrest for Covercrest, and uh, uh, we're really working hard on that and getting that structure set. Uh, it's very hard for a farmer. They're not changing like a, a seed variety or a, a herbicide within the same family. They're changing it into a, a very new uh, concept in their farm. Mm. And, uh, and all the other aspects also around supply chain. So getting the cost in a way that we can really have the seed harvest out of the farm and all the way to the processor is something that's not obvious. So we're working very hard on that. I also support Jack on his comments that those are very, very critical for us, and we're also working on those. Great. Thanks, Chris. Open question to both Jack and Chris. Uh, joining us on our uh, field day today, we have research institutions, extension groups, other industry partners, uh, growers, um, all the folks that want to see these new crops be commercialized and succeed. You've laid out some of the challenges. What could this group do? Uh, to support your commercialization efforts of these crops, what would you like from them? Yeah, so I guess from my perspective, I would say, um, you know, really helping with that commercialization piece. You know, if there's any grants out there, any federal funding, any other NRCS type programs, things like that, that uh, that we aren't aware of or that, are, that could be opportunities for us, um, anything like that. Um, or would be tremendous in, in helping de-risk for the farmer, especially with lack of insurance on there. So I think to me, that's the most important thing. You know, we, we, we can kind of get to a point where we can develop a market, um, you know, an end use market, but it's that de-risking piece and any help that can be provided there is tremendous. And, and I think, you know, for Evergreen has done a really good job on, on getting, uh, uh, you know, what, what funding out that's available out there, um, you know, awareness, bringing awareness to it. But, Continuing with that, I think, is the main driver, and that de-risking piece is so important. Um, you know, once we have an end market developed, it's that de-risking um, for the farmer since there's no insurance. So. Great. Thanks, Jack. Chris? I believe the extension groups involved can also help with the same thing, like expo uh, exposing these products to farmers, uh, helping us take to them the information ag around agronomy, details that can help a lot with the crop. What is the mo What are the top three components? top three actions that a farmer has to watch out. Uh, those things with the extension programs, they have a much better relationship with these farmers, the, the ones that they're in touch with than we do. So that would be also an additional point to what Jack just made. Great. Thanks, Chris. Well, thank you both for joining us for the, the panel today. Um, at Nutrien and Covercress's efforts to commercialize these new winter annual oil seeds are critical and we understand that you are undertaking a fair bit of time and effort and risk to get this done. And we're happy to be doing it in partnership with you uh, to bring these new uh, oil seeds to market that can deliver that new economic opportunity to the grower as well as the ecosystem services benefits to our rural communities. So thanks again. And uh, I think we're gonna hang on for some questions here.